I've tried and tried to write a story about the relationship between my son and I in the aftermath of his tragic death. I'd write a few pages, get depressed, and not write anything for a while. They say writing helps, but it would just get to be too painful. I've talked to more people since then than ever before in my life. I've gone over and over our relationship in my head. My successes and failures as a father, all the highs and lows of raising a son who's as stubborn and bullheaded as his parents. Remembering the feeling of pride when he accomplished a goal, and all the heartache you feel for him when he's struggling with life and the difficulty of becoming an adult. I've been given inspiration by those who've gone through my pain. They appear seemingly out of nowhere to give me that pat on the back I need to keep going. They remind me of something I used to tell Josh. You know, if they can do it, you can do it. It's at these low times of bitterness and anger that these pennies appear. My pennies from heaven. Or better, pennies from Josh. One of his friends coined that phrase. I like that. Each one of these pennies has its own little story, its own synchronicity. Each time it starts with some sadness and slowly works its way to laughter. That's right, laughter. That may sound a little insane, but my son was a comedian, so it really makes perfect sense. I got these three young girls come up to me on Fort Myers Beach, man. They come up to me and they go, Oh my God, can we have, have your autograph? Can we please have it? They're on spring break, right? I'm like, sure. I sign all three pieces of paper, they look at it and they go, This is bullshit, you're not El Dale Earnhardt Jr. <laughs> That's still $50, sister. <laughs> That's him there. Somehow he's watching over me now. In my darkest hour, he makes me laugh. It took a long time to realize that my son gave me the gift of laughter. Now, it's more than that. It's the ability to find humor in almost any situation. A lot of people probably won't understand that, but laughter truly does help you heal. Well, there are visits to those dark places. I mean, it's unavoidable. The pennies are a reminder to me that my son would be disappointed in me. It's time to put up or shut up, Dad. Time to practice what you preached to me my whole life. Never give up on yourself. If life gives you lemons, screw making lemonade. Inject some vodka in there and eat it whole. So these are the stories of those pennies. How they came along when I really needed them. How one by one, they've helped me on the road to becoming whole again. My buddy comes up to me one night, man, he hands me one hit of acid, he goes, don't take the whole thing. I'm going, fuck, whatever, it's one hit, right? I eat that whole hit, man. About 30 minutes later, dude, my world's ending. I'm in my bedroom laying on my fucking stomach, you know, holding the rail of my bed, thinking I'm shipwrecked in the middle of the ocean and shit. I'm fucked up, man. My dad walks in about this time. He figures out what's going on, and instead of doing what he should have fucking done, which was calming me down, no, no, no. He decides to step it up a notch. He jumps up on my bed. He goes, Josh, don't you worry. We're going to make it through this. If I die first, you can eat me to stay alive. I'm going, oh, fuck. I'm going to die. I come down in the morning. I'm soaked, drenched, head to toe, soaking wet with water, smelling like fish and shit, you know. I get down there in the breakfast nook. My dad looks at me. He goes, did you learn your lesson, stupid? I said, yeah. I'm never going to get on a boat and eat acid again. <laughs> September, Fort Myers, Florida. Absolutely miserable weather. Being from up north, I don't know how Josh put up with this humidity. I came down here to visit the police station, help my friend Mike with a video. First thing on the list when I get here, to go to the police station to be a bug in their ear. Hoping one day more evidence or a guilty conscience will give me some more answers in Josh's case. I drive around downtown for what seems like an hour. I can't find the police station. You wouldn't think it'd be that hard. A strange thing to happen for me since I travel for a living and can go almost anywhere in the country without a map. But I'm definitely going in circles looking for this police station 
my frustration is building. I can feel the edginess coming on. I must need some caffeine. Good thing I drove past a coffee shop for like the fourth time. I can at least get my caffeine fix taken care of. And maybe, just maybe, ask for directions. But I'll never admit that. As I get out of the car, I come across a lawyer or banker looking fella. So I ask him for directions to the police station. He just looks at me like I should probably know that. He didn't even break stride. Nah, as a matter of fact, I think he even sped up. I guess he figures I'll find it soon enough. Oh well, where was I? That's right, coffee. Back on the path. You know, as I walk around this place I used to think of as paradise, I'm struck by how different it feels now. The scenery and the climate are the same, but the sun somehow has a dimmer look. The warmth of Florida is now just felt as oppressive humidity. It is oppressive, but it never bothered me. It's no longer a vacation spot for me. It has become paradise tame. I walk to my car. As I approach the curb, I see two pennies linked side by side. One is heads up, one's heads down, as if someone had placed them there on purpose. They didn't have the look of just being tossed there. That strong feeling from before return. I feel a presence surround me. It was a feeling of intense sadness yet calming at the same time. I held the pennies and felt a closeness with my son. I knelt down by the wall to have a smoke and collect myself. I heard a voice ask, do you have a light? I hadn't seen the man walk up. Striking up a conversation I said, so you're a pariah too, huh? He gave me a quizzical look and said, what? I motioned to our cigarettes and said, smokers, you know, we're all pariahs now, banished to alleys and little cubby holes to smoke. And he smiled a little bit and we started talking. And he looked at the New York plates on my car and asked if I were from New York. He'd been a photojournalist in the New York City and New Jersey area for years. We chatted for a minute and then he started telling me about his son. He said when he was eight years old, he had been diagnosed with leukemia and it was terminal. The boy knew he was sick, but he hadn't been told the inevitable outcome. The man said he had opened a beer, and his eight-year-old son looked at it and asked if he could have a sip. He said his parental instinct said, no, you're not old enough. But in that moment, he realized that the boy, though having not been told he was to die soon, somehow knew he would never get to experience things like that. He knew somehow that his time on Earth was short accepting the fact with childlike innocence. He handed him the beer and said, just a sip and don't tell your mother. The man went on to tell me that it took about two years to come out of a fog after the boy died. It took five years to really accept it completely, but getting over it never happened. He only learned to live with it. And he said, keep your head up. You can get through this. What you're doing in your son's memory is a good thing. Don't let anyone make you give up. I looked up and he was just gone. Just like that, he was nowhere to be seen. I felt better, but was puzzled at how he disappeared so fast. I opened the door to my car and stopped. And I thought, I don't remember telling him about my son. Well, my mind tells me I must have, but I honestly don't remember telling him. I definitely didn't tell him the penny story as it wasn't even an idea yet. I remember hearing once that angels don't always have wings and look like they do in the pain. They sometimes look tough and scarred because they have taken all the punishment for those they are assigned to protect. Would all of that have taken place if I had done anything different that day? Any variation on my timeline, would that have changed anything? Nah, I don't think so now. That angel was looking for me and would have found me wherever I ended up. This encounter ended up being one of the most powerful for me and really opened my eyes to the connection to the penny. One up, one down. Heads up, the Marine. Well into his healing process and being used to help the newbies like me. One down, heads down, that was me. Still in a fog and lost as hell. It's going to be a long haul, but now I have hope.
So I'm really doing this out of drug preven prevention. Don't do not do it is what I'm getting at. You know, because i got friends. He's bad. You know, we're out partying the other night, and I'm having a couple of beers, and, you know, he's in the bathroom doing whatever he's doing. <laughs> you know? I wake up the next day, I'm like, dude, I have got a killer hangover. He's like, really? He's like, well, let's go out to the bar. We'll have a couple of beers and kill that hangover. I'm like, I'm good with it. So we go out to the bar. I look over in the corner. They got that new fancy jukebox, you know? The new fancy jukebox in the corner that talks to you and stuff, you know? I'm all excited. I'm like, hey, do you got a dollar? I want to play some music in a jukebox. He's like, yeah, I got a dollar. He reaches down in his pocket. He pulls his dollar bill out. It's still rolled up. It's got toast all over. I'm like, no, oh, really? He goes, just try it. I'm like, all right. He goes, no, the machine's stupid. I'm like, all right. So I work my way over to the jukebox, right, you know? And I did that thing that we've all had to do in high school at the vending, the vending machine, you know? I straighten the dollar bill out. I stick it in the jukebox. The jukebox, it stops, and it looks around. Hey, you got another dollar? <laughs> I got you some more. I looked at the bar owner. I said, dude, I'm sorry I turned your jukebox into a Coke machine. <laughs> Good habits. <laughs> I found lots of pennies over the next few months. Most were just pennies people had dropped out of their pockets. They always made me think of Josh, but they were in places where it would be normal for a penny to be found. But there were some that were so out of place that it made me take notice. And these are the pennies I write about. These are the pennies I believe find me instead of the other way around. On the first of these pennies to really get my attention, showed up a place that really reminded me of Josh. It was an afternoon in the spring, and I was looking for a spot to eat, cleaned the place up, sat down, and started to have my lunch. I was thinking about the last time I had talked to him, just going over things in my mind. I finished eating, and I picked up my sack to throw my trash away, and there was a penny. Now, I had cleaned that area before sitting down. It honestly was not there. I'm sure of it. Now, this was not the same warm, fuzzy feeling as the other pennies when I pick them up, and they remind me of Josh. This was that same feeling I had when we found the spot of the accident in Florida. Chills went up and down my spine. I had an overwhelming feeling of foreboding. There's really no way for me to explain it in flowery language. It was just plain creepy. I couldn't shake that feeling you get when you sense someone is behind you or watching you from somewhere. It wasn't that pleasant. It caused a pretty deep stirring of emotion. And it kind of left me shaken and wondering what the hell was that? I waited for the big event or revelation that this penny signified, but of course nothing happened. It's just my mind's way of grasping onto something, anything, to maintain a connection with my son. Anything to keep me putting one foot in front of the other, to keep from just laying down and giving up. Looking back now, I realized there was a big event, a revelation, connected to that penny. It turned out to be the feeling itself. That penny was kind of a bridge. A bridge to a new awareness of things I had previously just passed off as weird, but probably explainable. I was soon to cross another bridge. Well, this was not a metaphorical bridge, but an actual steel and concrete structure that would transport me to my next life-changing penny find. I'm in the middle of Fort Myers the other day doing this glass job for this lady at her house, right? And I get the sudden urge, nature calls, I gotta go to the bathroom, right? I go up to her, I said, ma'am, you mind if I use your restroom? She looked at me, she goes, you just gotta pee, right? I said, well, yeah. She goes, you don't mind just going out back, do you? So I'm pissing in her pool. <laughs> it seemed like it was the right fucking thing to do at the time, I'm just saying. I get back inside, man, I said, ma'am, would you mind if I got a drink of water? She hands me an empty glass. I said, what am I supposed to do with this? She goes, you can get your drink of water out of the pool, dick. <laughs> this is an old Irish toast, man. I may the sun always beat upon your face. May the wind always blow upon your back, and may the sidewalks rise to your feet. And if I don't see you all again, may God carry you to your good graces.